Nehemiah chapter 2, and we'll be reading the whole chapter beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of the heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him, a, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king. If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, Neither told I any man what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went, nor what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priest, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more reproach. And then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn, and despised us, and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah lived during the time that the Israelites were returning to Jerusalem from the 70-year Babylonian captivity. Now, remember the reason for the captivity. They had spent hundreds of years worshiping idols, turning their back on God, rebelling against God, caught up in all kinds of horrible immorality. Their society had become so immoral that the heathen nations that lived around them were repulsed. Now, think about how bad it is when God's people are living in such a way that it repulses lost people living around them. Not that they're repulsed by our religion or by our faith, but we're doing things that are so bad or so sinful that it repulses the rest of the world. 
That's where Israel was when they were taken into captivity. And God took the Israelites into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. But at the conclusion of that 70 year <laughs> captivity, the people were released and they were headed back to Jerusalem. They were headed back to Jerusalem and the kings had even given decrees that their temple and their city should be rebuilt. It was a time of great hope. It was a time of great excitement. Their heritage and their relationship with God was being restored. And the people were now looking forward to rebuilding the temple and to welcoming the Messiah. That's what they're looking forward to. They're going to rebuild the temple and they're going to welcome Messiah. And one of the things that had the people downtrodden in the book of Malachi was that they had done all these things. They had rebuilt the temple. They had rebuilt the city. But Messiah hadn't come yet. And Malachi was saying, he's still coming, stay faithful. Well, Nehemiah is here as the people are leaving Babylon and going back to Jerusalem and they're rebuilding and they're building that temple. Nehemiah is sitting here, he is the king's cupbearer. And so he doesn't get to go back to Jerusalem. But he wants to hear how things are going because he's excited. And in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah is visited by friends who tell him that things are not going as well as the people thought. The walls of Jerusalem had been broken down. The gates were burned up with fire. The people were being oppressed and afflicted. They were living in reproach. They were living in shame. They were being degraded. They were being taken advantage of. And this was as low of a point as Jerusalem could get. But Nehemiah had set his faith in the Lord and he called out to God to forgive him of his sin, to forgive the people of their sin, and to hear their prayers. And not only did God hear and answer Nehemiah's prayer, but God's hand was on Nehemiah. Nehemiah states twice in our passage that the good hand of my God is upon me. Nehemiah trusted the Lord. He had set his faith in the Lord and he knew that God's hand was on him. And any success that Nehemiah has from this point on, he knows he has that success because God's hand is upon him. He doesn't take credit for the king's favor. He doesn't go to Jerusalem and say, hey guys, I talked to the king into giving us a bunch of money. He says, God has blessed this because his hand is upon me. He says that the king gave him all he requested because the hand of the Lord was upon him. The hand of God was upon Nehemiah. The hand of God is upon us today as well. The hand of God is upon us when we surrender to serve him. The hand of God will provide our needs as we serve him, and the hand of God will prosper us as we serve him. First, the hand of God is upon us when we surrender to serve him. In verse 11, Nehemiah prayed. He said, O Lord, in verse 11, go back to chapter 1, verse 11. Nehemiah is praying. He says, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and to prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah's prayer to God was not simply that God would make all the bad go away, that he would make all the pain go away. Nehemiah prayed that God would be attentive to his prayers and that God would prosper him and grant him mercy in the sight of the king. Now why does God, why does Nehemiah want God to prosper him and grant him mercy in the sight of the king? Why does he want that? Because Nehemiah has purposed in his heart that he was going to serve the Lord in such a way that would see the city of Jerusalem rebuilt. And that would involve Nehemiah having to leave the comfort zone of being the king's cupbearer, which means that he would need the king's favor in order to do that. And for Nehemiah to get the king's favor, he knew that he was going to need the Lord's help. So he prayed 
that God would bless him with the king's favor. And he prayed that God would bless his effort with success. Nehemiah was going to be going into a war zone. And he was going to suffer affliction with God's people. Who does that sound like in the Bible? Besides Nehemiah. Who else was willing to leave the palace and suffer affliction with God's people? You think of Moses. You think of Jesus. He left the riches and the glories of heaven to suffer for our sins. So we go to Nehemiah chapter 2 and we look in verses 4 and 5. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send unto Judah, send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. So Nehemiah is here. He is in the presence of the king. He is sad. The king calls him out on his sadness and says, This is nothing more than sorrow of the heart. And so Nehemiah explains the situation to him. And Nehemiah makes a request to the king. And he asks the king for permission to go and do the work which God hath laid out before him. But before he does that, he prays to God. And if we want God's hand to be on us, we must be submissive to his will. And if we're going to be submissive to God's will, we need to be willing to pray for God's will. If we aren't willing to pray, then we aren't willing to submit ourselves to God's will. So he prays to God, and then he reveals his heart through his request to the king. His request to the king was that he wanted to go to Jerusalem to rebuild it. He wanted to serve God by leading his people through a revival. Now this is something that Nehemiah had surrendered himself to. He was giving himself over to it, and he was trusting God to work out the details. And then he puts that prayer into action by asking the king for provisions. In verses 7 and 8, Moreover I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So Nehemiah wants to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. So is he just going to run out to Jerusalem and start stacking stones on top of each other? He knows he needs some things, doesn't he? So the king asks him for his request. He prays to God, then he makes the request. And notice what he requests. He requests things that will be needed to rebuild the walls. See, Nehemiah trusts God. He has faith in God. But having faith in God does not mean that you check your brain at the door. Now, I know we like to make an exercise of faith by seeing how crazy of a thing are you willing to do and call it stepping out on faith. But God has given us brains. And he has given us the ability to form logic. And he gives us that ability for a reason. And Nehemiah has a brain. He knows what he needs to accomplish this mission. He's doing this for God, for his honor and his glory. And so when he makes his request to the king, he requests the things that he needs in order to complete God's mission. He knew what he would need. He knew who to ask to get it. And he trusted God to give him grace in the king's sight in order to obtain those things. And Nehemiah says that the king granted him all he requested according to the good hand of my God upon me. So having faith and acting on faith doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't able to use logic. It means that you do the best you can. You make good, sound decisions. You know 
where to go to get the things that you need and you provide God, you trust God to provide those things for you. When you surrender yourself to God's will, he places his hand upon you and you can't go wrong as long as you follow him. The hand of God will provide our needs as we serve him. We will have what we need in order to accomplish his mission. Nehemiah, in order to rebuild those walls, would need God's protection. In verse 9, he makes a request. He says, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. He made his request. The king gave him the request as the good hand of God was upon him. And one of the things that the king sent with him was the captains of the army and the horsemen. So Nehemiah had protection. Nehemiah would need authority. In verse 7, he requests, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. Those letters from the king gave Nehemiah authority to go to Jerusalem. Nehemiah would, be, would need protection. God provided that through the king's army officers and horsemen. Nehemiah would need authority. God provided that through the letters that the king wrote on Nehemiah's behalf. Nehemiah would need building materials. In verse 8, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. Nehemiah needed building materials. He requested that the king give him letters to Asaph, the keeper of the forest, so that he could get the beams needed to build those gates and to build those walls. And God provided. Verse 8 finishes out. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The hand of God will provide our needs as we serve him. And he provided the needs of Nehemiah as he surrendered himself to rebuilding those walls around Jerusalem. Accomplishing God's work, however, is not something we get to do by ourselves. It's not something we're capable of doing by ourselves. It's a team effort. And Nehemiah needed help. And so in verses 17 through 18, he goes to God's people. Then I said unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah went to the people to motivate them to rebuild with him. And his motivation was the fact that God's hand was upon him. And once the people heard this, they were motivated too. They strengthened their hands for this good work and they said, Let us rise up and build. Doing God's work is not so much about what you can do or who you are, as much as it is about trusting God to provide for the need and to bring you into contact with the right people. We have a great work to do here in Brownwood, Texas to lead a revival in this community. And this is a work that we need to be willing to surrender ourselves to. If all we're doing is going to church on Sunday and this is the day that we think about it, then we forget about it the rest of the week. We haven't surrendered ourselves to the work of reaching this community. We need to surrender ourselves to this work. Our resources need to be poured in to this work, not of building a church member, not a church member, not of building a church building, but of reaching people in this community. It needs to be what we're about. We need to surrender ourselves to that, and we need to trust God to accomplish that work through us and to bring us into contact with the right people who can help us in this work. We should also trust God to provide for the work. If we know that God has called us into this work, we need to trust God to bless it and to provide the needs for this work. We don't have all the money in our back pocket right now to do it. We don't have our vacation Bible school money in our pocket right now. We don't have our sunrise service outreach in our back pocket right now. We don't have 
Brownwood reunion outreach. We don't have all that in our hand right now. But we know that God has called us to reach this community. So we can trust God to provide for us to reach out in these ways. You know, I remember about four years ago in this work, and we began to see the need that we were not going to be able to reach the full potential of this church in this building. We were going to need a place that we could expand, that we could build a more suitable worship facility, one in which people who have to use walkers or wheelchairs or scooters can get around it. You know, if you have to use a scooter, you can't get down that hallway. Which means if you're a disabled member of this church, you cannot use this church restroom because you cannot access it. You have to go outside, around the sidewalk, come in through the door that gets stuck, and hopefully somebody will help you across the hall. If you're a disabled member of this church, that's the lot that you have if you have to go to the restroom. We knew we needed a more accommodating facility. We can't have a building that we can't keep cooler than 90 degrees in the summer. You know, you bring people into worship in a 90 to 95 degree building, you're going to have heat strokes. And so we decided that it would be advantageous for us to begin collecting money to purchase property to build a new building. And this congregation voted to follow through on that. And we sent it up to our sponsoring church. And our sponsoring pastor didn't want to do it because he didn't think we had gained enough people. He didn't think we had enough money in our bank account to begin the process of collecting money to build land, to, to build land, to buy land, to build a building. And Brother Jim Slocum made the statement during this debate. He says, you know, sometimes you just have to trust God to provide in his time. He said when Jesus had the loaves and the fishes from that little boy, and he said, make the men sit down, how many of y'all would have stayed standing up? Because after all, there's only five loaves and a couple of fishes. He said, you trust God to provide in his time. Uh, we have money in the bank. We have more than a lot of churches have. We have land that is debt free. That's a blessing. Amen. There are a lot of churches that they've still got a huge amount of debt just on their land. Ours is debt free. And we have the opportunity to build a suitable facility for a couple of hundred thousand dollars. <coughs> which is a lot of money. But there are churches that they can't get into one for less than two million. So we have got opportunities ahead of us and God is blessing. We need to trust Him and move forward. We have outreaches coming up. We have got the sunrise service on Easter Sunday. We've done this for the past two years. We have met new people each and every time we've done this. We need to trust God to bless that. Vacation Bible School. We need to plan it out and execute it this year and we need to trust God to bless that. Brownwood Reunion. We have put so many tracks and flyers and church invitations and letters and all, I mean, thousands of pieces of literature on the streets of Brownwood every other year. We took this past year off. This is our year to do something again. Is a photo booth the way to go? Maybe, maybe not, but we need to come up with something. And we need to reach out in our community. We need to trust God to bless that. If we don't trust God to bless it, if we don't think that God's going to bless the sunrise service, if we don't think that God is going to bless Vacation Bible School, if we don't think that God is going to bless Brown Reunion Outreach, if we don't think that God is going, to, is going to provide us with the needs to complete our church building, then our belief is that God has not ordained this work. And if God has not ordained this work, we are wasting our times. Our times and our time. <laughs> Go join the big church downtown and let's just take it easy. But I am here because I believe that God has ordained this work. Amen. He didn't call me out here to waste five years and hundreds of thousands of dollars of the association's money and walk away without a fully functioning church that is reaching this community. He didn't call me to that. We need to trust God 
to provide for the work because his hand is upon us. And finally, and I think I've kind of gotten over to this a little bit already, but we need to trust God to prosper us. The good hand of God prospers us. God leads us to success, not failure. In verse 19, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? We need to get this idea that if we do the will of God, that people will applaud us. We need to get that idea out of our heads because it does not work that way. Often, those who do God's will are laughed to scorn. And I can tell you, when I came out here, I was laughed to scorn. I have a friend that's in the Southern Baptist Convention and as y'all know, Brownwood is a hub of Southern Baptist churches. We've got the Southern Baptist University. We've got the Heart of Texas Missions Office here. And we have got a Southern Baptist church on just about every corner. Not criticizing that. I am not trying to, to speak badly of that at all. But I will say that my Southern Baptist friend said that I was moving to Brownwood, Texas to show the Southern Baptist how it's done. That's not my point in coming here. That's not our point in being here. I was hired at a job, and the guy that hired me says, here's another preacher who thinks he can convert the city of Brownwood. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not the first one that's tried to come here and reach people. But oftentimes, those who are laughing us to scorn are God's people. People who are in bigger churches look down on small churches. People will make fun of you for living out your faith. And sometimes this scorn comes from other Christians. You know, the issue of homosexuality came up on the internet the other day. And the way it was discussed, I decided I couldn't be silent about it. So I made a very short statement about what the Bible says about homosexuality. And the people... Now, I've got friends from high school that are homosexuals. They've chosen that lifestyle and there's nothing I can do about it. And I've got friends on Facebook that have made that decision. I don't know why, I can't understand it, but that's the lifestyle choice they've made. Not a single one of them got mad at me for expressing what the Bible says about homosexuality. Nope, the people that got upset at me were other Christians or people who professed to be Christians because how dare I judge? And I didn't judge and I didn't make disparaging remarks. I just said, this is what the Bible says about this. And, I, and all I said was, the Bible says this is a sin. We're not going to get applause for doing the right thing. They're not going to like your status on Facebook when you preach the truth on Facebook. We don't do what we do for the applause of men. If we do what we do for the applause of men, we are in this for the wrong reasons. Lady Gaga sings about, I live for the applause. I live for the applause. She's, well, now we know what she's all about. She's not about God. She's about herself. Nehemiah responds to the scorning from Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. In verse 20 he says, Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us, therefore we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Nehemiah said, God will prosper us. That word prosper doesn't mean to make rich. It means to push forward and to make successful. Nehemiah said, the God of heaven will prosper us. In other words, God will push us forward and God will give us success. The walls were going to be built because God was going to keep the people on the walls, building the walls, and he was going to bless their efforts in having the walls built. 
Do we trust God to prosper us? Do we trust God to push us forward as a church and to make us successful as a church? Then if you trust God to prosper this church, to push us forward, to make us successful, to work His will through us, that we accomplish His mission with His mighty hand upon us, if we trust Him, we should arise and build. We have a serious issue on our hands today. Just like those walls of Jerusalem were in ruins and the gates were burned up with fire, that is our society. Our society lives in darkness. It gropes in darkness. It struggles in darkness. Drugs are all over the place. You throw up a rock in Brownwood, Texas, it will land on a meth lab, statistically speaking. That's how bad it's gotten. You, ha you have people killing themselves with inhalants in the Walmart bathrooms. Okay, they got her to jail, then she died. But I mean, this is going on. Our society is in ruins. And God has called us to shine the light of his gospel into this darkness and to see lives turned around and healed through the saving power of Jesus Christ. But it's a mission that we must be willing to surrender ourselves to. Are you willing to surrender yourself to this mission? And will you trust God to prosper this effort? Let us stand.